Political Affairs. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll make sure to keep note of that. All right. So, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual shouting session at Hearts for Health. Today, we are honored to be joined by Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee is the Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery, the Chair for the Department of Surgery, and um, just a, a leader in general um, at the UMD, UMDNJ Robert Wood Johnson Medical School at Rutgers. Uh, Dr. Lee has served as really a leader in the field of cardiothoracic surgery. He's been featured on platforms like Insider and GQ, where he's showcased his work as a cardiothoracic surgeon, garnering millions of views. And all in all, we're really excited to have you on today, Dr. Lee, to hear from your expertise and really just dive into the field of cardiothoracic surgery. We've dived into other fields in the past with other speakers, but surgery in terms of the cardiothoracic field is a new one. Just a quick few reminders for those listening in, for those new participants listening in, we have a Q&A saved for the end. So any questions you have for Dr. Lee, type them in the chat, that chat box that you have um, under the live stream, and we'll cover them during the Q&A. Also, for those interested in staying updated with future shadowing sessions, what you can do is follow us on Instagram, where we post these flyers for upcoming shadowing sessions, and you'll stay updated, updated that way. Another way you can get update, up to date with sessions in general is through our email listserv. So we send out announcements, for future shadowing sessions through our email listserv. To join the listserv, you can subscribe on our website at the bottom of each page, or just email us at our contact email, shadowing.h, the number 4h at gmail.com, and ask to be added on. Just include your email and your name, um, and we'll be able to add you on from there. So with that said, um, those are all the reminders we have today, and just a quick intro for Dr. Lee. But uh, I want to pass it on to you, Dr. Lee. Take it away. Great. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for the invite and for, the, for your kind words. And I want to say <clears throat> hello to everybody who may be listening or who may be listening in the future. And hopefully I can uh, shine a light a little bit on my path to how I got to where I am today. <clears throat> uh, I've been in clinical practice for about 20 years, which means I finished all my training about 20 years ago and have been an attending cardiac surgeon uh, at a couple of different places. I started my career at Cornell. I was there for about 10 years on faculty. And then I moved to New Jersey uh, with a short stop at Hackensack uh, University Medical Center <clears throat> uh, for one year. And then I got recruited down to Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Brunswick, where I initially served as the chief of cardiac surgery for about a year and a half before I was elevated to the position of chairman for the department of surgery. <clears throat> So for those of you who don't know how the academic uh, structure works is that uh, the school is divided into departments and each of the departments has a chair and the departments, there are clinical departments like surgery, internal medicine, pediatric, psychiatry, OBGYN, et cetera, all the major specialties. <clears throat> and then there are um, uh, non-clinical or basic science departments like biochemistry, uh, anatomy, physiology, uh, microbiology, etc. <clears throat> Each department has a chair. Uh, that's the person who's in charge of that department in terms of setting a vision for the department and also setting uh, sort of protocols for all the faculty within the department. And then within the department, it's divided into divisions. So within our department of surgery, we have 10 divisions. There's a division of uh, cardiac surgery, thoracic surgery, urology, general surgery, colorectal surgery, pediatric surgery, plastic surgery, vascular surgery, surgical oncology. <clears throat> um, and those are the main uh, divisions within the Department of Surgery. So we have about 80 full faculty and about 120 full-time staff, and I am responsible for a budget of about $25 million. So in addition to my administrative responsibilities of running the Department of Surgery and everything therein, which includes clinical research and education, we train residents, we train fellows, we train medical students, et cetera. We also do a lot of research. <clears throat> in addition to that, I also have a clinical practice within cardiac surgery where I do roughly uh, 400 heart surgeries per year myself. Uh, our program is actually one of the largest in the Northeast. We do 1,600 hearts a year. 
and I do about 400 of them myself. <clears throat> so a uh, pretty busy schedule. And the, and the questions may be, well, how did I get to this point in my career? What were the driving forces? What were the decisions I had to make along the way? So I grew up in a family of physicians. My father, uh, who passed away about a year ago, was a general surgeon. <clears throat> my mom, who is turning 90 uh, next weekend, actually, uh, was also a physician. Uh, she was originally OBGYN, and she was one of the first women to graduate from the major medical school in Korea. <clears throat> they both graduated from Korea. So I grew up in this household of physicians, and so uh, all along, you can't help but have that be an influence. So it's important in your lifetime, and particularly as you pursue careers in medicine or anything in health, to have mentors or people you look up to who can provide guidance, who can provide um, advice <clears throat> and career direction. So for me, initially during my formative years, it was, it was my parents. Uh, I didn't have a very bright and shiny view of medicine. I had a very realistic view of medicine. I saw my dad get called away on emergencies while we're out to dinner. Uh, having to rush home, drop off the family so he can go to the hospital and, and take care of business. So I knew what I was getting myself into. <clears throat> then I went to uh, college and in college I was a pre-med uh, major and things back then, I graduated college in the mid 80s. So things back then were a little different than they are today. Um, I, and, and so I, I would say that in college I didn't have a lot of great guidance. And that's where the difference is. <clears throat> My parents, because they were uh, educated in a foreign country, didn't know the system uh, within the United States, how to apply, how to get through the process, what's important, what's not important, um, what do admissions look at uh, when applying, et cetera. So I didn't have that guidance. So I had to rely on other people to help me through that process. But ultimately, I applied to medical school. I got in. During medical school, I had had a focus on surgery because I'd always looked up to my father and I'd always wanted to do something that was very proactive. The thing about surgery is that we as surgeons, we are very, very proactive in terms of uh, creating a better health environment for the patient. Meaning there's a problem, we operatively fix it, and we get them better and we get them on their way. <clears throat> and that was the part about surgery that I really enjoyed was that it was very proactive and you're doing something um, technical to, to, to fix the patient, okay? So the difference is, for example, in surgery, if you have a car and your carburetor is broken, the surgeon's gonna go in and replace the carburetor. The medical doctor, the internal medicine doctor, wouldn't replace the carburetor, but would perhaps try a different gas mixture to enhance the output of the carburetor. <clears throat> so that's, that's sort of where the difference is between internal medicine and surgery. So I'd always been focused on surgery. And when I was uh, in medical school, my intent was to become a plastic surgeon. So <clears throat> when I went to general surgery residency, I looked at residency programs who had a long track record of having placed residents into plastic surgery training programs. So how training goes after medical school is after medical school, you do a residency, which is a general field of training within that area of surgery. After residency, you have what's called fellowship. Fellowship has a residency as a requirement and fellowship is further subspecialization, whether it be cardiothoracic surgery or colorectal surgery or surgical oncology, et cetera. They're all specialties within the world of surgery, but you need that extra few years of training to get you to that point. <clears throat> so my goal was always to do plastic surgery and I'd always looked at residency programs that had done well in placing uh, residents into plastic surgery fellowships. So during my residency, which was five years, general surgery residency, I had always wanted to do plastic surgery. And so that was my goal and that was my mindset. 
during general surgery residency, you rotate through all the different subspecialties every month. You have a different rotation and you get more seniority and you operate more and you have more responsibility. For cardiothoracic surgery and plastic surgery, you apply during your fourth year of residency, about a year and a half before graduating. So I had applied for plastic surgery programs uh, during my fourth year. <clears throat> And I was actually, I remember this very clearly, I was actually at Yale interviewing for plastic surgery as a fourth year surgical resident. It was a Saturday. And we were on a tour with one of the plastic surgery fellows at Yale. <clears throat> and at Yale at the time was a very famous, happened to be a very famous cardiac surgeon whose name was John Aleftariatis. So on our tour, we walked past the cardiac surgery ICU and I asked the fellow, I said, hey, can we go check out what's going on in there? And he said, why? We don't, we don't get consults from that service. We have nothing to do with them. And I said, I, I just want to sort of check it out. <clears throat> to which he answered no. And we went on our tour. And once we uh, finished the tour and I came home that night, uh, I was then on call that night at one of our uh, affiliate hospitals <clears throat> as sort of an outside rotation. And during that call night, a patient came into the emergency room uh, with uh, a ruptured uh, thoracic aorta from a car accident. And this was pre-stent era. So all these things had to be fixed with open surgery. So at 12 o'clock at night, I am calling the cardiac surgeon at home, telling him, I've got this patient, they had this problem, they need to go to the operating room. I had never met this cardiac surgeon again, because this was an outside rotation for us. He came in, he didn't even blink. He said, okay, book the case, I'll be there in 30 minutes. I was like, great. So he came in, I met him uh, by the patient's bedside <clears throat> and I introduced myself. And he said, what year are you? I said, I'm a fourth year. He said, can you sew? I'm, I said, well, I mean, I can sew, but I, I don't really know what you mean by that, but I, I guess I can sew. He said, great, I'll do half and you do half, which was an unbelievable experience. So by two o'clock in the morning, we're in the operating room, <clears throat> operating on this patient uh, with a huge incision on their side to access their uh, descending thoracic aorta. We replaced the aorta with a graft, which was about that big around and about that long. And <clears throat> we started the operation at two and we finished by about 5.30 on Sunday morning. And the patient survived and did well. So we finished at 5.30. I, I, I then called my chairman at six o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. I said, I'm changing my mind. I'm gonna withdraw from my plastic surgery and I'm gonna pursue cardiac surgery. So the point of this story is that it wasn't that one case. It was the fact that I had always enjoyed cardiac surgery greatly during my rotations, during my residency. But that case was a prime illustration as to what my life could be like in terms of job satisfaction, intervention into patient care, impacting patient out outcomes and well-being. <clears throat> And so I withdrew from the, from the plastic surgery match and decided to apply for cardiac surgery. Now I had missed my window of application during my fourth year for cardiac surgery. So now I would be applying the following year, my fifth year, which would then leave a gap year prior to beginning my fellowship. So I decided that I wanted to do a research year for, during that gap year anyway. So during my fifth year, I applied for cardiac surgery and it's, it's what's called a match, which means I interview places, the programs interview applicants, we put in a list, they put in a list, it gets put into a computer and you get one match. So I as an applicant get one name and that's the program I'm going to. So I matched. I matched at Rush Presbyterian in Chicago, which was one of the better programs at the time. <clears throat> so then after I graduated my residency, I went off to do my uh, basic lab research at, at Cornell. And my research was in gene therapy. We we're looking at utilizing viruses to deliver genes into 
uh, cells so that we can then manipulate the cells to produce different kinds of proteins that can be expressed that can then impact uh, things like blood vessel growth, uh, heart vessel growth, and all these types of things. It was a great experience. During that year of research, <clears throat> uh, my lab mentor uh, said, listen, uh, I think you should stay in the lab for an extra year because we're, we're doing some great stuff. Uh, it'll certainly help your career. It won't hurt you in any way, but it does necessitate you pulling out of that program with whom you matched. So after long and after thinking about it long and hard and talking to uh, people of influence in my life, like my parents, uh, we all agreed that it was going to be the right thing to do. So I withdrew from that program that I had matched in in Chicago, which was a big deal because at the time that I was applying, <coughs> there were about 200 and 80 applicants for about 100 spots in the, in, in the United States. And here I am giving up a spot uh, to stay in the lab for an extra year. They were really angry. Um, I was a little bit blackballed from the, the world of applications and applicants. And so it was a problem, but I still did it. And I stayed in the lab an extra year. And then I applied the following year. So this is my third year of applying for fellowships. First year, plastic surgery, second year, cardiac surgery, match, pull out, second time, cardiac surgery. And luckily I matched. And I matched at my top program, which was Cornell, which is where I was doing my research fellowship anyway. So I matched at Cornell <clears throat> and then I stayed there for, for two years uh, as a cardiothoracic surgery fellow. And this was, these were the, uh, during my general surgery residency and my cardiothoracic surgery fellowship, these were the years where um, it was prior to the implementation of the 80 hour work week for residents. So as you may or may not know, surgical residents have an hourly cap of 80 hours per week. They're not allowed to work longer than that. And as a consequence of that, if you do work longer than that, the, pro the program can be put on probation which is a big deal. <clears throat> but when I was training, this was prior to the implementation of the 80 hour work week. So when I was a general surgery resident, surgery residents used to work on average about 120 hours a week. And when I was a cardiothoracic surgery fellow, we were working 120 to 140 hours a week. There are only 168 hours in a week. So you can imagine the amount of time we spent in the hospital, standing, walking, taking care of patients, working. So I did my two years of training at, at, at uh, Cornell and my thoracic uh, uh, training was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which was right across the street. So the field of cardiothoracic surgery, for those of you that are not aware, it's everything within the chest. So from the base of the neck down to the diaphragms and from side to side, okay? So that means you take care of the lungs, operate on the lungs, the esophagus, the trachea or the airway, the mediastinum, which is the, which is the middle of the chest that does not include the heart. So there's things like a thymus gland and there's some other things in the middle here. And then also cardiac, okay, which is below, above the diaphragm, below the neck, between the two lungs. <clears throat> so within the world of cardiothoracic surgery, there's act, it's then divided into general thoracic surgery and cardiac surgery. It's not a separate board exam. It's the same board exam. It's the same type of training for both of us, but we do declare one or the other. The surgeries and the treatments and everything else has gotten so sophisticated in the world of thoracic surgery, just like it is in the world of cardiac surgery, that it requires absolute attention that you can't do both effectively. So we, we do generally choose. <clears throat> so after my training, I, um, I, I stayed on faculty at Cornell as an, as an adult cardiac surgeon. If you want to do pediatrics, it requires an extra year beyond your fellowship. It's a super fellowship. If you wanted to do transplant and heart failure, it requires an extra year of super fellowship. <clears throat> so I stayed on faculty at Cornell for 10 years where I built my clinical practice and built uh, uh, some research, did a research program. And then once I was about 10 years in at Cornell, I wanted to 
uh, I didn't have a leadership role. Uh, I had um, climbed my way up to associate professor. So in the world of academia are academic ranks. There's instructor, assistant professor, associate professor, and then professor. Professor is the highest rank. And there are um, uh, sort of things you need to accomplish in order to be promoted from one to the next and the next and the next. At any rate, at Cornell, I was an assistant professor and then I worked my way up to being an associate professor. And then by the time I was 10 years in practice, I sort of wanted to spread my wings a little bit and do some interesting things like pursue minimally invasive surgery. And it was not real popular at our program. And as a consequence, I also was looking for some leadership roles. <clears throat> so I actually got recruited to Hackensack University Medical Center in Hackensack, New Jersey, which is now part of the Seton Hall Medical School system. And there I was recruited as chief of cardiac surgery and vice chair for the heart and vascular hospital. I was only there for a year, but during that year, I actually learned a lot about leadership. <clears throat> You know, the, a lot of these things are not things that you learn in school or learn during residency. A lot of it is learning on the job and trying to learn as much as you can by reading books, taking courses on leadership, etc. Many of my colleagues have gotten advanced degrees like MBAs and other master's programs. So during that year, I had actually learned a lot about leadership and program development and things like that. <clears throat> And during that year is when I actually got recruited down to Rutgers, Robert Wood Johnson. And that's where I really wanted to be uh, because that, that was back to being a little bit more of an academic environment, uh, which is what I was used to from coming from Cornell. So at, at Robert Wood, uh, I was recruited as chief of cardiothoracic surgery, a big cardiac program, um, and had been there for about a year and a half and had really... Uh, change the program in terms of quality metrics, volume, uh, all that type of stuff. And then a year and a half into that job, I was asked to take over the Department of Surgery because the chair had left and it was an interim basis, uh, which means temporary. So I was there uh, as the interim chair for about two years. And then two years into it, they asked me to take the job on permanently. Prior to that, I had been Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs. <clears throat> which was responsible for all the clinical affairs of the, of the medical school, um, which was also a very big job. Uh, but I continued to operate during all this time. And then as I took on the job of chair for the Department of Surgery, I, I backed down the senior associate dean for clinical affairs because it was just too much to handle. It was a lot of work. So I have been able to uh, advance my career into academics. I have a lab, I have a basic science research lab, but also leadership roles throughout the school and the hospital. And a lot of it is uh, taking advantage of open circumstances and open situations. And how you take advantage of those things is by one, being prepared. So you need to be prepared. You need to do your homework, uh, never show up unprepared. Do extra in terms of courses uh, for self-improvement. Uh, don't pretend to know everything because we don't. We do not know everything. And the interesting thing about the field of medicine is that we're always learning. We are committed to a life of learning uh, and always trying to hone and perfect our craft. So <clears throat> uh, reading books on leadership, there are a lot of courses on leadership you can take. Uh, extra degrees, master's in public health, master's in business administration, master's in healthcare management. All these things are very, very valuable tools. Um, you don't necessarily have to take uh, organized degrees or organized courses to do these things. There are other um, uh, leadership courses you can take, which are shorter term, but give you the, the basic skeletal structure. And what I would also say is, uh, you know, we're all worried about time commitment, but this is not a sprint. Uh, getting to the, to the end goal is, is a marathon. And an extra year here or there makes no difference in the end. I got my first job when I was 36. And so uh, I couldn't be happier now because you're always improving with every step that you take. You're advancing, 
you're doing something different, you're staying relevant. And so innovation is another area where I would say, do not be afraid of innovating. Do not be afraid of new technology. A lot of us who have trained in a certain era are scared of new technology because it's hard to adapt new techniques. It's always hard to do something new. But it's what keeps you relevant and it's what keeps you current. And so, um, you know, briefly, that, that was my journey to where I am today. <clears throat> I, um, as I said, I'm the chairman of the Department of Surgery. Uh, I have a lot of administrative responsibilities. So my, my, my weekly schedule is Monday I operate. I generally do four cases on mon four heart surgeries on Monday. Tuesday morning I operate, I generally do about two heart surgeries. Then Tuesday afternoon is dedicated to administration where I'm in my chair's office, uh, have lots of meetings, uh, doing paperwork uh, on the computer, et cetera. Wednesday mornings are education for the residents and the fellows. <clears throat> and so we spend a lot of time with uh, educations and lectures. Then I also have a research lab meeting on Wednesday, every other Wednesday morning. Then Wednesday afternoon, uh, again, it's more administrative time, uh, meetings, all this types of stuff. Thursday mornings, I see new patients in the office, so patients who require elective cardiac surgery. Although cardiac surgery, no cardiac surgery is truly elective, like you would think of a bunion. But when we talk about elective cardiac surgery, we're talking about patients who have stable disease, needs an intervention, but they're coming in from home for their operation. So Thursday mornings, I generally see uh, my elective uh, new patients, and I'm in office hours from 8 o'clock in the morning till about 1 o'clock p.m. I do spend a lot of time with the patients. I spend about 45 minutes with each patient so that uh, we, I, I give them a third description of what their problem is in layman's terms, give them a third description of what we can do to improve or fix their problem and alternatives, then have allow them to answer as many ask as many questions as they would like. And then after uh, uh, office hours on Thursday early afternoon, then again, it's all administrative stuff for the remainder of Thursday afternoon. Then Friday, again, it's an operative day. I do four hearts on uh, four heart surgeries on uh, Friday mornings. Or, or all day Friday. Um, <clears throat> it's a busy schedule, but it's really, really rewarding. And at this stage of my career, I, I have most evenings uh, free at home uh, with my family and same thing with weekends. And so a lot of people will um, uh, choose specialties based upon what they hear about lifestyle. Lifestyle and practice has little to do with the specialty. It has to do with the practice within which you are practicing and the hospital circumstance where you're practicing. So again, field like cardiac surgery, you think, oh my God, you're gonna have a terrible lifestyle. Yes, I get up early. I get up at, uh, I wake up at about five. I'm usually in the hospital by six. Uh, on my operative days, I do start operating. I do start surgery at 6.45. Um, I generally put in about a 12 hour day. I'm usually home by about six or seven. And, uh, but my evenings are free and my weekends are free. And so I can tell you that there are all sorts of specialties in the hospital that I see uh, working all around the clock. So it's, again, has to do with the type of practice you're in, not so much the specialty. So don't let the specialty dictate your hours of work. It's how you practice. And I would say, pursue a specialty that interests you. If you spend, <clears throat> if you sleep uh, eight hours a day, okay, and you have 16 hours, and you put in uh, a 10 hour workday, that's, that's what, roughly 40% of your total time available to you. Or, about 70% of your waking hours are spent at work. If you're spending that time anywhere, you better be happy. So it is important to have work-life balance. Uh, I encourage everybody to take their time. If they're off, they're off. I don't want them to be coming in. No one gets extra credit for working harder than other people. Uh, 
it is important to have work-life balance so you don't burn out. Um, but again, choose a specialty that interests you. Choose a specialty where you're going to be happy because you're spending a lot of time at work. So you might as well be happy. So that's, that's about it for me. Uh, that was about 30 minutes. <clears throat> and so uh, I'd be happy to make this more interactive, what, whatever you feel, Michael, and uh, I'm happy to follow along. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for that description. Hearing the stories was really exciting. And I'm sure the, uh, the audience listening in can share the same sentiment. We have a few questions that we'd like to ask. And also, by the way, if, you know, just for more engagement, the purposes of more engagement, if you want to, you know, kind of uh, pimp the audience out there uh, with some questions, then feel free to, and I'll just read off the responses we get. There's a bit of a delay, but um, we'll get some responses going. In terms of the sure. questions though, um, one of the questions we wanted to start with is how you elaborated on how stents have spared the use of open surgery in some cases. What other advances have there been made over the field of cardiothoracic surgery specifically that have made things different now in terms of practice than they would be in the past? Sure. Uh, you know, technology has been a huge thing uh, in the world of cardiac surgery. <clears throat> so number one are coronary stents. So there are all sorts of stents uh, that we use in, in the field of surgery or in medicine in general. So coronary stents are used in, in coronary arteries. So there are three arteries that feed blood to the heart muscle itself. And if there's a focal blockage in one of those arteries that either causes a heart attack or puts the patient at risk of having a heart attack, oftentimes a cardiologist can put a stent into that coronary artery, which basically opens up the blockage. These arteries are somewhere between uh, one and a half millimeters and three millimeters in size, and they're accessed, <coughs> excuse me, either through the artery and the wrist where you take your pulse and under x-ray guidance, they feed catheters and wires up into the heart and they shoot dye into the coronary arteries, which gives us a roadmap. The other way to access is through the femoral artery, which is right in the crease of the groin. There's, you can feel your pulse there as well. And same thing under x-ray guidance, wires and catheters are fed up into the heart. So by being able to stent um, simple, more simple types of blockages, it obviates the need for coronary bypass uh, in, in a lot of these patients. Now you say, but aren't you shooting yourself in the foot and taking away your own volume of surgical volume? Well, no, actually it, what it has done is it has led to a whole different uh, population of patients who maybe would not have had surgery in the past. So patients who've had multiple stents and are still having problems and recurrent symptoms and recurrent blockages, those are the patients who are now coming to, to, to the operating room for surgery, for bypass surgery. <clears throat> there are also bigger stents, stents that are this big that we can now place into th things like the descending thoracic aorta uh, for, um, uh, for rupture or for aneurysms. Uh, there's uh, a procedure called TAVR, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So there are four valves within the heart and the purpose of those valves is to keep blood moving in one direction through the heart. The aortic valve is the valve that sits at the top of the heart <clears throat> and it, it is uh, the valve through which blood must be pushed for the blood to be circulated throughout the rest of the body. In, in, in some patients, that valve can get very tight over time. And as a consequence of that, the heart has to work harder to try to push blood through that tight valve and out to the rest of the body. When it gets to a certain degree of tightness in the past, historically, we had always operated on these patients, taken out the bad valve and sewing a new valve through standard heart surgery techniques. <clears throat> but with TAVR, we can actually re- replace the valve through catheters placed through the groin without having to do open surgery. So again, just like the cardiac catheterization, we feed catheters and wires up into the heart through the big artery in the leg under x-ray guidance. <clears throat> and we pass a valve through the, over these catheters into the sick aortic valve. So we push the sick aortic valve out to the side and we put a new valve within it and it sits there. This, this procedure has obviated the need for open surgery again, but what it has done is it has not necessarily cannibalized the surgical volume, but it has opened up 
therapies to patients who historically had been too sick, too old, or too frail to undergo conventional heart surgery. So now instead, these patients are now candidates for the TAVR device. And then there are all sorts of different types of pumps that we can place into the heart to assist, to assist the failing heart, to augment blood supply, to augment blood flow. And these pumps had not been prior, previously uh, available. We have artificial heart technology. So there's a lot of stuff uh, that's out there. We are a very tech-driven specialty. We use a lot of devices. We use a lot of pumps. We use a lot of different things that help us in the treatment of patients. So yes, a lot of advances. Yeah, and that's really the exciting part. To your point, as you mentioned earlier, um, it really makes it a, a lifelong learning Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. just being a physician. So our next question is from a student asking, could you tell us more about your experiences with specifically minimally invasive surgery? Right. So uh, minimally invasive surgery in the world of cardiac surgery <clears throat> is practiced uh, by less than 15% of the surgeons in the United States only less than 15% of the cardiac surgeons in the United States do any minimally invasive surgery. If you look on their websites, they all, they all list minimally invasive surgery as something that they do, but in practicality, they don't. So for, for the purposes of things like valve surgery, um, I do a lot of minimally invasive surgery through three inch incisions on the right chest to replace the aortic valve, to repair the mitral valve, to do both the aortic and the mitral valve, to do the aortic, mitral, and tricuspid valve, all through small incisions on the right chest. What that has done is that has um, greatly reduced complications and made recovery much quicker. The typical hospital stay after standard heart surgery, which is the incision down the middle of the chest where we divide the breastbone, the standard hospitalization for those patients is about five days, five, six days. Minimally invasive surgery has allowed us to get patients out of the hospital in two days. So much quicker recovery, much quicker return to functional status with the same results. The key to everything that we do that may be new is to ensure that the results are just as good, if not better than the gold standard. The gold standard is still the, the, what we refer to as the sternotomy approach or the incision down the middle of the chest. So the only way I would continue to do this is if the results were just as good, if not better. And for us, for those of us who do a lot of this minimally invasive stuff, it is just as good, if not better. All right, well, thank you so much for that insight. Another question we have is about specialties. So you talked about you know, your own path going through the first five years of general surgery as your residency. And then you alluded to how there's many fellowships in the field of surgery and also um, the branches you have that you go through or, or you manage as the chair for surgery over at Rutgers. So with that said, is it common to have more than, in the OR, is it common to have more than one subspecialty surgeon present? Or when you're working on the same patient, um, would you usually just have one subspecialty dedicated to that? So for example, could you have a vascular surgeon and a, and a cardiothoracic surgeon in the same room, in the same OR, or is that oh, not yeah. even the case? Oh, oh yeah, we, we um, there are often sort of combined procedures that we do where there are territories that cross between two specialties. So uh, um, for example, the world of cardiac surgery and vascular surgery, uh, the descending thoracic aorta, which goes from the upper back down to the diaphragm. And then once it goes below the diaphragm, it becomes the abdominal aorta. And there are oftentimes aneurysms that affect that entire aorta. And in those cases, we operate together because the abdominal aorta is the specialty of the vascular surgeons. The thoracic aorta is the specialty of the cardiac surgeons. And if it's one patient that has both problems, then we're going to work together to fix that problem. There are also <clears throat> um, areas in which we may not be operating simultaneously but in sort of shifts between within, within one operation or for the same patient. 
So if you take, for example, urologists, urologists are experts in the field of uh, the urologic or urinary system, right? The kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, uh, and the urethra. So the urologist may work in concert with surgical oncologists or colorectal surgeons because they're operating in the same area and different structures may be affected by a tumor. If there's a colon tumor that's eroding into one of the ureters and maybe extending towards the bladder, this is an operation that the two of them could operate together. So the, the colorectal surgeon would take care of the colon cancer part. The urologic surgeon would take care of the bladder and the ureter part. And they would work together to figure out what's the best amount of tissue to take out to cure this patient of this problem. And then how do we put it all back together? I see. Wow, that's insightful. All right. So we have another question about your work with the research lab. So currently, um, as an attending and quite now experienced decades into your practice, what are you currently working on with research? So I have uh, a couple of areas of interest for me are, are is clinical research, meaning <clears throat> looking at results. How do we do things better? How can we find some data to support a new way of treating patients uh, while they're in the hospital. So that's what's called clinical research. And then we publish our results and it hopefully changes how we practice medicine. Then there's basic science research and basic science research is, is the research you see in laboratories, you know, test tubes and pipettes and all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> in the basic lab, we're working on, uh, there's a there's a, a small intracellular glycoprotein called CREG, C-R-E-G, which, which stands for cellular repressor of E1 genes. So this small glycoprotein is, uh, is, has involvement in the development of smooth muscle cells or, smooth, or muscle that lines vessels. It also has a role in the development of cardiac tissue. And so if you uh, overexpress this protein in stem cells, the stem cells then convert into cardiac myocytes, which then coalesce on a Petri dish and then start beating on their own. And so we'd like to use that technology eventually for cardiac repair. <clears throat> but other things we can do is we're looking at genetic defects uh, that cause weak heart pumping. And we think that a, a defect in this protein can cause mu uh, muscle, heart muscle to be very, very weak. The other thing about this small glycoprotein is that unrelated to muscles and cardiac and vascular development is that this small protein may play a role in the development of diabetes. So that's the direction we're really going in now because it's a huge patient population. 10% of the United States is diabetic, which is 35 million people in this country are diabetic, not a small proportion. Most of them are type two diabetic, which means it's an acquired diabetes over time. They're not born with it. And, a, and about 10% of, of that diabetic population are type one diabetics. So the vast majority are acquired. And mostly because of things like weight, uh, lack of exercise, uh, poor diets, uh, genetic predisposition, uh, et cetera. It's the, it's the Western world. It's a, it's a, it's a modern day problem. Yeah, definitely. Um, you mentioned mentorship as an important cornerstone uh, for students. And given our student population, I think it'd be really fitting to ask, what are your recommendations in terms of networking, finding those mentors and you know, it might not just be any mentor that you need. It might be the one that's right for you, one that's personable, fits your personality, just complements you well and all. Um, how would you recommend that someone can find that match? Yeah, so, uh, you know, mentors are not only important when you're students. Mentors are, are important lifelong. I still call the people that I had considered my mentors early in practice and when I was a fellow. Uh, I still call on these people for advice. Uh, you know, the, the thing about mentors is, number one, mentors have your um, well-being in mind always. 
Number two is they will give you an objective opinion. And number three, hopefully they have experience so that they can guide you. <clears throat> so what I would say is that you can have mentors who are sort of life mentors, you know, smart people who've been around, who are successful at whatever they're doing, and they can help guide you in terms of overall life plans, where you want to go, how you want to think about money, for example, or family or what have you. But it's important to also have mentors that are a little bit more specialty specific. Uh, if you're looking to go to medical school, it's probably going to be important to have mentors who are in the field of medicine because they can guide you, who have gone through the process of applying and securing a, a surgical residency, who have gone through fellowship, etc. Mentors will also change in life. As your life changes, your mentors also start to change because you start looking for people who can give you specific guidance uh, in terms of where you want to go, how you want to be. So uh, early on, it's going to be uh, teachers who have impact upon you. Then it's going to, or coaches or friends or family friends or acquaintances, et cetera, who you look up to and who can have an influence upon you. Then as you start sort of honing down uh, career direction, then your mentors start to hone down in that same direction so that they can provide the advice and uh, direction that you need uh, for career. In terms of cases, uh, one student asked, do you have any memorable or interesting cases that you've recently worked on? Or if any don't necessarily come to mind, are there any new aspects of cardiothoracic surgery that you've come to appreciate more since completing fellowship? So, you know, we always, we, we always have memorable cases and they're memorable to us for uh, different reasons. Sometimes it's because uh, you took on a really difficult, bad case that was very, very high risk and amazingly the patient did well. So it's one of those uh, hero moments. Then you have memorable cases that didn't do so well. And you, you, uh, you beat on yourself a little bit because you feel like you've done everything right. And yet the patient had a bad outcome, uh, which is, which goes with the territory, unfortunately, of what we do. Um, <clears throat> there are memorable cases because of just the patient was interesting. The operation itself may, may not have been out of the ordinary, uh, may have been a straightforward operation, but the patient was memorable for whatever reason. So the, there will always be memorable cases. Um, uh, you know, pro probably none right now that I would, that I would mention. Um, but you will always have those experiences and that, that touch you one way or the other. Yeah, I'm sure it just comes with the passion behind the specialty. Yeah. And it's also, you know, an important thing to do is, you know, we're always taught to, maintain a certain distance from our patients. Don't get too involved. Don't get too involved. You know, that's true and not true. Uh, you have to be involved somewhat uh, to show because you're human. You can't be treating humans and not be humanistic about it. There's going to be emotions. Um, I have cried in the hospital when I've lost a patient. Um, I have laughed with patients after they've had a great outcome that was unexpected. Um, you know, uh, one of my favorite things that happens is after I finish operating, I, I always talk to the patient's family about how the operation went. And you know what? One of the best experiences when they hug you uh, right afterwards. And, and uh, it's just so heartwarming. And that is something you never get used to. Yeah, it's really um, one of the special things about the specialty or just in general with medicine is that people will be vulnerable, vulnerable with you. So it, it, it's, it's very special in that way. It's unlike yeah. any other profession. No doubt. Yeah. It's with, amazing what people will tell you also. Oh, yeah, definitely. And as we wrap up with this session, I wanted to talk about it, something a little relevant to the circumstances 
we've seen today and also in the past two years with the pandemic. So just in general, we've heard of patients with COVID and respiratory failure being treated with ECMO or um, extracorporeal me membrane oxygenation. Can you elaborate for those who might not be familiar on what exactly this treatment slash procedure is about and how successful it is? Sure, ECMO, uh, exactly as you said, stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So it's a very fancy way of saying what we're doing is we are hooking the patient up to a pump. The pump draws blood out of the patient, puts it through what's called an oxygenator, which means gas exchange occurs, CO2 is taken out and O2 is put in. Then that blood is pumped back to the patient. So there are two kinds of ECMO that we use. One is called VA ECMO and the other is called VV ECMO. So VA ECMO is veno arterial ECMO, which means we're taking venous blood. So venous blood is the blood that's been used up. It has no more oxygen in it, it doesn't have nutrients in it, and it's being sent back to the lungs to get oxygenated. So we shunt that venous blood out of the patient we put it through the oxygenator and we get arterial blood on the other side of the oxygenator. It's now good blood that has essentially passed through the lungs, which is the oxygenator and gets sent back to the patient on the arterial side through an artery. <clears throat> and that is used for patients who have failing hearts to essentially pump the, heart, pump the blood and help oxygenate the blood much like the lungs would do so this circuit is augmenting both the heart and the lungs. Patients with COVID whose primary problem are the lungs is that the heart is able to pump the blood, but when the blood gets pumped to the lungs, it doesn't pick up enough oxygen before being sent back to the patient on the other side. And as a consequence of that, the patients are chronically have low oxygen. So with veno venous, <clears throat> because the heart pump is functioning normally. We're taking venous blood out of the patient, we're oxygenating it, and we're sending it back to the venous side to pass through the lungs passively, and then get sent to the body to be used. So the patients who are on, uh, who have COVID are VV ECMO patients, because they're usually their hearts are okay. <clears throat> the, um, the success rate of VV ECMO is about 25%. That those are international numbers. And the reason it's so low is because, first of all, these are patients that would have died anyway. With, without, without an intervention, 100% of these patients would have died. The 75% death has to do with the fact that ECMO is not a cure for what you're treating. ECMO buys you time. And the goal of putting patients on ECMO is that it's a bridge. It's a bridge to something. It's a bridge to another device. It's a bridge to a different operation. It's a bridge to recovery. Whatever it is, it gets you from one place to another. It in and of itself is not a, uh, a active treatment. It's a support device that buys you time. So for patients with COVID, what we're hoping is that the ECMO keeps the patient alive long enough so that their lungs can then recover. A lot of these patients who are so sick that they require ECMO, many of them, their lungs never recover. And as a consequence, you can never take them off ECMO. And then eventually, if they're in the hospital long enough under these extreme conditions, other things start to happen, other complications occur. <laughs> and unfortunately, 75% of them uh, wind up passing. 25%, however, which is 25% more survival than would have done so without a device, are able to get weaned off ECMO eventually and eventually get discharged from the hospital. And certainly those are great patients to see. Definitely. Thank you so much for the insight over that. Uh, it really revealed, um, for those who haven't heard about it, a lot of, a lot of unheard uh, info over, over that new treatment. And it's interesting to, to hear that it doesn't necessarily provide a, a cure or even a treatment. It just lengthens the amount of time that you'll, you're going to be able to go on for. 
That's exactly right. And uh, buys you time to then treat the patient with their other therapeutics. Yeah, exactly. Another student asks, and I think we'll probably wrap up with this question as we near the end of the hour, regarding literature for children, or if you haven't already done this, if any of your colleagues, any fellow um, coworkers you know of that have done this, just writing literature for youth, whether they be children, anyone who is not yet an attending or just early in age around the awareness and education about your specialty being cardiothoracic surgery or explaining what your work looks like in general. There's some physicians we have that are um, into that field. It's similar to mentorship, but kind of at a mass level. Um, have you been involved in that or have you known any fellows who have? Not really. Um, you know, we, we do, there are a lot of outreach programs um, where we go into schools and we do some educational things because we want people to live heart healthy lives. Uh, be cognizant that what you put into your body matters and what you do with your body matters. Um, but a lot of these things are primarily done through larger organizations like the American Heart Association. Um, talk about smoking cessation, about weight loss, about eating right, about fats, about all that, uh, getting on an exercise program, uh, just being aware of heart healthy living. Um, most of those things are done through these larger organizations, less so through uh, specialties like us. Primarily our influence is, is when um, students get a little bit older or a little bit more mature into their uh, subspecialization education, whether it's medical school or, or um, PA school or nursing school or allied health professions, um, that's when we have our influence upon them, not only for their own health, but the impact that they can have on their patients. Sounds good. And one more question just popped into the chat. Just quickly, if we could cover this, you, you already went over um, this as it overlaps with what we discussed earlier with ECMO, but the student is asking if you've seen patients or you have any insight to share around heart complications associated with COVID. Yeah, we, we have seen a, a, a greater number of uh, heart attacks uh, in patients who are COVID positive. Uh, we've also seen a higher incidence of strokes in patients who are COVID positive. Granted, a lot of these patients have the substrate, meaning they already have some cardiovascular disease. So it already, they're at a little bit increased risk anyway, but we've seen uh, certainly that COVID has accelerated some of these circumstances. Yeah. We're right. still learning about it. Yeah, it is. That's true. Um, two years in, we're, we're kind of still in the process of, of learning okay. through it. And we've seen, um, cases of long haulers, people who even after having COVID um, are still, still dealing with symptoms, even though they're not testing for positive. So that's also another area to discuss. But I think that'll wrap up today's session at, as we're at the end of the hour. Um, we really appreciate your time, Dr. Lee. And I just have a few quick reminders for those listening in to our shadowers. To earn attendance or credit for attendance, I should say, uh, for those who are new to the program, you must pass the quiz to receive a certificate with at least 60% correct we have posted the quiz in both the chat box and it's also available under our website, under the virtual shouting page. The quiz will be due at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time this upcoming Wednesday, April 13th. And after passing that quiz, you're gonna receive a certificate from um, the, passing that quiz to the email address you inputted in that quiz. Um, so make sure that you use the right email address, uh, whatever works for you, whatever your prefer preference is. And if you don't receive that certificate in your inbox, please check your spam folder. Although if you don't see in either of those, feel free to reach out to us over our email. And for next week, we'll be seeing Dr. Patiski for pediatric nephrology this uh, or next Thursday, April 14th at 7 p.m. Central. Um, in general, these sessions are weekly on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for taking some, some time to join us. And we really do appreciate your, your insights. All right. Thank you, Michael. And I want to wish everybody good luck.